Want to hear a more diverse perspective on art? Tune in to Speaking of Art, the official podcast of Sharjah Art Foundation, featuring conversations with some of the most prominent artists and curators from Asia, Africa, and around the world. Listen to Speaking of Art wherever you get your podcasts. Want to hear a more diverse perspective on art? Tune in to Speaking of Art, the official podcast of Sharjah Art Foundation, featuring conversations with some of the most prominent artists and curators from Asia, Africa, and around the world. Listen to Speaking of Art wherever you get your podcasts. And hello, good evening, and welcome to this Joy News Special Thought Leadership event live from the studios of Joy News and Joy 99.7 FM. This whole week here at Joy News, we have focused on a crisis that has left many families devastated, the dialysis crisis. A largely underreported subject grabbed national headlines when the country's premier teaching hospital announced an increase in the cost of dialysis. There was an uproar. But we decided to go beyond the headlines to examine a problem that is a symptom of a much bigger challenge with Ghana's healthcare system. Tonight, we bring together patients, caregivers, policymakers, and citizens to explore for solutions. My name is Evans Mensah. We start tonight by pausing to remember 15 year old Priscilla Santi, a brilliant and hearty pupil of the Mampon Catholic Basic School. Priscilla died on Sunday, just two days after we recorded her story and her desperate plea for help for our dialysis crisis series. Priscilla dreamt of being a nurse. That dream died with her because she and her family simply could not afford dialysis treatment. Tonight we remember her and the many others suffering her condition whose story has inspired tonight's conversation. It's not easy uh, always chasing people or asking people for help because it is very difficult to sustain. And this is a disease that you always have to be coming to the hospital. Without that funding, you can't come for dialysis. And here is a case that that is a a, a pay as you go. Mom and dad do not have money either. We have become miserable. I am appealing to the government to help me live through this. Otherwise, I need that. They said that could be a 3.5. Mm-hmm. They say every session is 350 CDs. You know the harsh economic conditions now. So I have to beg before I get money for my weekly dialysis at this private facility. Um, we are pleading with government to help us with the dialysis. We cannot, we cannot pay because of that. We are not able to go for dialysis. And that, that one too is our strength. If we don't do the dialysis, we are suffering. We are pleading them to help us, pay the money for us so that we can die at least two times or three times a week. I want the government to support me so I can live to fulfill my dream of becoming a nurse. Please forgive me now. I see that I've been blind. I lost my lovely daughter Sunday dawn. My lovely daughter Sunday dawn. She bloated due to her failing kidneys and died in spite of the dialysis. My heart is heavy and I've incurred debts in my quest to keep her alive. We are ordinary farmers. My husband and I have been left with nothing. 
we must pay 4,000 Ghana cities in order to claim our daughter's body from the hospital tomorrow. In her anguish, my daughter dreamt of becoming a nurse. Unfortunately, that was not to be realized. I begged the government to intervene. This is too much for us to bear. It was the last academic year. We noticed that it was unusual changes in her body. In the evening, that her mother called me that the child has died. She was very good in academics. She also participated in sporting activities in the school. And she is friendly. She is punctual, respectful, and very calm. Um, so it is a blow to Mount Poncalic and the entire teachers. Love is what I need to help me know. Our condolences to Priscilla's family. So, can Priscilla's story inspire change for others with her condition in a failing health system? And, and how do we ensure that? Well, joining me tonight for this conversation are Dr. Insia Sari, is a presidential advisor on health and former director of general of the Ghana Health Service. He will join us pretty shortly. Uh, Perpetual Ofori Ampofo is a president of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. Well, she and her members, they are caregivers. They see these patients on a daily basis. Some of them know they can save them, but of course the challenge is many of them lose these patients. And, and she's here to give us a sense of the national picture. She's in the studio with me. Also joining us tonight is Kwame Safanasiru, who is a pharmacist by profession, a Democracy and Development Fellow in Public Health at the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD. Uh, Professor Samsung Entry, President of the Ghana Kidney Association, Professor of Child Health and Pediatric Nephrology at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUSC. Dr. Opokuwari Ampoma is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. We expect him to join us pretty shortly. We also have the National Health Insurance Authority. Uh, Oswald Isyam Mensa is the Director of Corporate Affairs. He will also join us. Uh, later, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Titus Bayer. You know him. He's a former General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, uh, worked extensively with rural hospitals, particularly in the Upper West region, currently running for parliamentary seats in, on the ticket of the NDC, of course, in Lambushi constituency. And Prof, you see this on a daily basis. From all the things that we've just heard there from Kwame Sapanasiudu, what do you consider to be the single most important challenge that kidney patients face currently among the whole list and the raft of things that we just heard articulated by Kwame? Thank you very much, Evans. And uh, good evening to my co-panelists and to the listeners. Um, so we are happy that uh, this discussion is coming up uh, because over the years we have been very much worried about the challenges that patients with kidney disease face in terms of cost. And so as I've articulated, um, we pray that people with kidney diseases don't get to what we call end stage. You know, there's a whole spectrum of kidney diseases. You can be diagnosed with kidney disease. You have five stages, and uh, you can be managed. Stage one, stage two, up to stage five. Once you get to stage five, it means your kidney is no more functioning. The function is just uh, gone to a halt. And therefore, if you don't get artificial kidney, um, you will die. And um, we know everywhere in the world that the cost of treatment for getting artificial kidney, what we call kidney replacement therapy, i.e. dialysis or kidney transplant, is so expensive. Yet, that is the solution. There's a solution to what would otherwise have been a dead end. As he's been said, it's the announcement. Things are now that we're having this conversation, we're having a, a policy dialogue on this going forward. Any regret from where you sit that that was even a conversation that started because Kolebu announced an increase and actually charged people for it? 
What, what has been the reflections over the last one week? I'm, I'm curious to know, at Kolibu and yourself. All right. Thank you very much. So um, um, let me begin by saying that uh, I need to set some of the record straight. Okay. So uh, this conversation is something that we've been having in the hostel for quite a while now in terms of the sustainability of uh, renal dialysis as a means of treating um, patients with chronic kidney disease. Now, let me also situate Kolebu's, where the role that Kolebu has played. Um, at the last count, we had about between 700 and 900 patients in the entire country who are on regular dialysis. Okay. Now, out of that 700 or so, around about 300 to 350 are treated at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital alone. Now, um, this presupposes that Kolebu is actually carrying a lot of the burden in terms of providing dialysis services. If I would do about 2,000 dialysis sessions every month, and the, how to sustain these services has been a major challenge. In fact, we are grateful for um, the partnership that we have with the First Sky Group, uh, who single-handedly has sponsored dialysis patients throughout the last six year or so years, and they're paying about one million CDs every quarter for that. So, in fact, if you come to Kolebu, in terms of those who are actually paying, about 80% of our patients who are on, on our dialysis program, uh, you know, just about the number is around 250, uh, don't, don't pay anything at all because they are sponsored by uh, the First Sky Group. The rest of the patients either pay out of pocket or are sponsored by organizations. So for a large majority of the Kolebu patients, because we've had this strategic partnership with the First Sky Group, most of our patients do not have to pay any fees at all. These are the faces and beating hearts behind the dialysis crisis. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Kojo Bafo Ahinkra. Now, Kojo has end-stage kidney failure, right? As he's sitting there right now, that's his current condition. He's been on treatment for eight years. How he's afforded that, well, he'll share the story with us. Thomas Vincent Kahn, of course, we know of uh, Thomas. He's been a kidney patient on dialysis for more than a decade. We have here those who are in the trenches providing the health care. James McKeon Amwa is a senior nursing officer at the renal dialysis unit of Kolebu. And, of course, we have uh, representing the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Fred Adumakumbwating. He's a regional director of health service at the Bono East region. Uh, so these are our panelists here in the Joy Studio, and we can now start to understand the stories behind the big numbers that we've been discussing. I, I want to start with you, uh, Kojo Bafuahinkra. First of all, help us understand what it means to have end-stage kidney failure and what you have to do to stay alive. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. End-stage kidney failure basically means your kidney is not able to function properly. It's no good to retract the excess water for you to give proper urine, filter the blood for you, so you have you need dialysis three times a week. To How be. much does it cost you? Well, when I went to Kolebu 2015, it was up two point something before the first guy group came in. As in 200 and something? Yes, I forgot the exact week, but it was two point something. Okay. That was a 2015. Yeah, but that's when I went there, that was it. Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> um, Subsequently, as time goes, they've been increasing it, increasing it until we go to the 380. Yeah. But proud to that, uh, the first Sky Group company has been in there supporting us. Yeah. My brother, if not that, uh, most of us will not be sitting here by now. So mm -hmm. that has been what has been sustaining us up to now until 22nd May of this year when the unit shut down to OPD. Mm -hmm. The unit was shut down to OPD patients because the consumables were shot, so right. it was sh shut down to us. So we have to find our ways. Thank God, once again, there are a lot of um, private facilities around that have been taking care of us. So, so do you have to pay for this private service? Even Kolebu, we are paying. The first guy is paying. So, how much more private facility? Right. So, how much are you paying for private dialysis? Currently, it's between five to thousand cities, depending on where you go. Every time. Yeah, a session. So, so how many sessions do you have a week? Me, on my diagnosis, I'm supposed to do three. But mm -hmm. I don't have the means, so I'm, I do twice a week. I keep telling people that this is one sickness that when you have it, it's not just physically draining, but psychologically and emotionally. Because when it becomes, uh, uh, when you are not well like that, it becomes a burden on everybody around you, even mere friends. Like, uh, they're also not happy, you know, 
uh, you being in that condition. So it becomes, you know, that kind of purging to everybody. And it's been like that for uh, the family as well. So it's, it, it's not been easy, Koju. It's never been easy. Now, you told me that in the early days after your diagnosis, you had to be referred to a psychiatrist. Yeah, yes. Why? Yeah, I think that um, uh, the doctor, uh, and yeah, I remember uh, Dr. Yawasanti Aoku. Uh, he referred me to see the psychologist because then, like, I was going through a lot psychologically. And there were times, like, I really wanted to even give up. I'm, I'm very glad Dr. Fred Adumakumbuating mm. is here with us. And, of course, you ply your trade in the Bono East region as the director of health service. Let me ask you this. In the Ghana Health Service, is there a team that is working to solve the dialysis crisis? If you look at the national health policy, one of the key things that is there in the policy is workplace infirmaries. And by means of workplace infirmaries, all places that you have people working, even marketplace is part of them, school infirmaries, if you come to Bune, we have what we call wellness clinic. And the wellness clinic is a clinic that anybody can... Want to hear a more diverse perspective on art? Tune in to Speaking of Art, the official podcast of Sharjah Art Foundation, featuring conversations with some of the most prominent artists and curators from Asia, Africa, and around the world. Listen to Speaking of Art wherever you get your podcasts. Walk in and have your BP checked and have your sugar checked. That is one major thing the service is doing. And that you don't have to be sick to go to the hospital. And then we have other pharmacies that are also checking. In Bunuis, we have what we call the Wellness Day. Every last Friday of every month, we have made so noise about it that, look, if you have not checked your BP, then on your birthday, kindly check. So we have what we call the wellness clinic. If you go to any Ghana Health Service facility, you can go in and ask about the wellness clinic. But in spite of that, the numbers are rising. So it's not working. Is there, it? there are two issues that we can look. You know, we, there's always darkness before light. And the moment you begin to look, the moment you begin to look, look, all these cases that we are talking about, like it never existed, they have been there yeah. until a torchlight was shown on. So unless until but you begin, knew, you knew, and the health service was aware. Obviously, we are, doing, we are doing a lot of massive screening with support from PATH and other people. We are doing massive screening. That is one. Two, there is a need for all of us to be educated that when we pick hypertension, it's not a license. If you look at the statistics, most of the people at end stage adult are males. Yeah. And because the males are health seeking pattern, yeah. a behavior yeah. is very different from the others. Yeah. I don't know about the statistics, but you see that we are the culprit. How do we also engage all sociologists, anthropologists for us to know that, look, hypertension, diabetes, the earlier you pick them and even go on medication, it's better. But because you haven't engaged these people. You are, you are making it like a suggestion to... No, we are engaging them seriously. Okay. And joining me in the studio, and there's a lot of uh, questions around policy intervention to, to try and deal with this particular challenge. With me in the studio is a presidential advisor uh, on health. And so I'm going to uh, bring him into the conversation. Obviously, a perpetual listen with me uh, with the Ghana Race and Nurse Association, Dr. Ampoma himself with the, uh, the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Uh, on Zoom, as you may have noticed, we have the uh, Dr. Uh, Kwame Safansedu with us also. Um, I want to bring you in, uh, Mr. Zasari. So you've had a conversation. The, from the patient's point of view, the cost element is key, right? And for them, that is an issue, a barrier that needs to be removed uh, in dealing with this, with this whole crisis. First of all, you agree this is a crisis that needs urgent addressing. And from what we're hearing from the uh, Ghana Health Service rep, they, 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 there's an appreciation of the problem but the issue really is about finding the solution to it. Yeah, thank you very much, Evans. Um, I've been listening to all the speakers, especially the patients and Dr. Adwako from Ghana Health Service. You see, renal, end-stage renal disease is one of the non-communicable diseases, as 
the other gentleman said that is causing a lot of problems, not only in Ghana, but worldwide. Because people have changed their lifestyles. People are growing older and all sorts of things. So if you add all together, the, and you don't prevent and early diagnose these diseases, you end up having end-stage renal disease. And that is where the problem is. And once you end up as end-stage renal pro, uh, disease, pro, then you need treatment. And I've realized that people are, we are just talking about dialysis, dialysis. But the definitive treatment for end-stage renal disease is a renal transplant. Yeah, but what you say is uh, it's a function of policy. Yes, the yeah, policy. You, 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 are the, you are the presidential advisor. Yeah, the policy is. So, what, what's, what, the what is this thing that the. the policy, what, what advice have you given the president on? Yeah, this? the policy is that if you look at the, at the policy document of this present government, we have what we call. Um, what Dr. Admako was describing that everyone, everybody in this country, as much as possible, should be able, if for nothing at all, during your birthday, walk to a clinic or a hospital, or even a health center, or a teaching hospital, and then said, I'm coming to check myself. You are not sick. That is what Dr. Admako was describing. And I can assure you that it has been institutionalized in Ghana Health Service, because I've been in Ghana Health Service before. There's a health prevention unit in Ghana Health Service. If you go to Dodowa Hospital, I'll give that example. There's a whole unit for wellness clinic. So wellness clinic is a policy document, a policy uh, directive in all the health sector from the teaching, from the chief center right down to the teaching hospital. And there must certainly be a disconnect between what the hospitals are supposed to do and what the community actually feels I'm, must I'm, be done. I'm coming there. You see, that's one of the things that you are saying here. But it's, it's also policy effective. Yeah, it's right? a policy, to make the policy effective, you, the, uh, the media, have to carry this to the people. Yeah, but we have I'm happy that you're having this discussion. Yeah, but, but then you have to agree <clears> that once <throat> you design policy, not for the sake of it, the policy has to yeah, be implemented. Yeah, the, the, the policy has been There's definitely designed. a missing link there, and possibly a failure that is leading the to The missing this. link is very easy to solve. The missing link is you use the media, you use the community, you use everybody to propagate. For example... Our brothers in the diaspora, when they come here, they will tell you, oh, I have to rush back because I'm going to do my medicals. It's not sick. But in this country, people wait until they are sick, sometimes wait until they are carried to the hospital, and then they are told that, gone so soon, or you have a, a, chronic, a renal failure that you need a dialysis. It, you have ended it. But if you start early, I will say that it is, I call it adult way. When you put in the do policy document, I say it's called adult way. Children are not sick when they go for way, isn't it? Yeah. You carry the child. Other, you know that every two weeks or every first six weeks, you have to take the child to this. Age. So at least once in a year, we the doctors are also, we are copious to it, and nurses. We don't do it. Once a year, just take, like, walk to the wellness clinic, sit down, you'll be weighed, your height will be taken, they do your BMI, they check your BP, blood pressure, to see if you have a high blood pressure, they will check also your urine, simple test. And if you are a woman, they will check your breast and maybe your uh, womb, the service. And if you are a man above 50, they check if you are urinating well. Once you do that, you get to know whatever is going to happen to you and all these diseases early enough to be treated. Because there are two types. You can have an acute kidney, fail, uh, kidney problem, and then if you don't treat it, you go into chronic kidney problem. And that's where you have a problem. Once you read there, either you like it or not, you have to purify your system. And it's through, one of the ways is through the kidneys. And luckily, there are two kidneys everybody has. So everybody has a one spare kidney that maybe you can give to another person. And that also comes with a policy statement. We are now trying as a much... So what is the policy statement on that? The, the policy is that we are now doing kidney transplants, for example, in Kualibu, but we should have a law backing the donation, the storage, and then also giving the kidney to I take note of the use of the word should. Uh, the should. Address, yes. we, we, we must have, and we must have. why don't we have it? We are working on that. I know that there's a document which is, which is being uh, looked at at the moment. I remember when I was in Ghana, service, we set up a committee. We wrote a document as far back as two, uh, 2018, which we presented, and we, that's what we are, we are making. Has cabinet approved it? That's what we are making sure that it goes to parliament. It's parliament. The cabinet approval goes to cabinet. We will make sure that it's done. But what I will say is that 
But the wellness clinic is a policy directive which has been given to Ghana Health Service and all the agencies of the Ghana Health Service. I'm, in, I'm interested in the policy, uh, the law bit. What's the timeline? When do you hope to, to hit Parliament for, for that process to start? I know the uh, Ghana Kidney Association, the Ghana uh, Ophthalmology Association of Ghana, the Fertility Associ uh, Group in the Obstetrics and Gynecology are all now That's advocating, and the plastic surgeons. And I'm an, a very strong advocate for it. Because plastic surgery is talking about plastic surgery. When somebody has bends, you can also have a, a skin yes. transplant, a tissue transplant. For example, common uh, I, a lot of people are blind because of cornea, uh, cornea scarring. And we do cornea transplant here, and people see again. So these are things that we have to, as quickly as possible, make sure. And where I said, we'll make sure that it comes through cabinet, the minister brings it to a cabinet. Any timeline? Timelines? Because people, this is a matter of life and death. We are working on it. Okay. I won't tell you, if I tell you by the end of the year, you come and ask him why it hasn't been done, but it has to go through a whole process. Yeah. Stay with me. But the, for the wellness clinic, it's a policy. And today, I'm telling every Ghanaian, you don't have to be sick before you go to hospital. Walk to the hospital on the week, the month, or the day of your birthday before you come and chill. Just walk to the hospital or after chilling. Walk to the hospital. Go and check yourself. Check your weight, check your height, check your parameters, blood pressure, and everything. And then you will know if you are sick, especially for kidney disease. Dr. Isiasari talks about a government policy, which obviously has been implemented from 2017, where people have to go to these clinics and see a clinician and get their, uh, what do you call it, um, blood pressure um, measured, um, their sugars checked, their breast checked, and all that. The first thing we'd have seen is an uptick in our outpatient per capita because they'll first have to be booked in as an outpatient per capita. Uh, outpatient. In the year 2017, and I'm quoting government statistics, our outpatient per capita was 0.99. It's now 1.06. After implementing a policy for seven years, six and a half years to be fair, and you ask me, Evans, that on the basis of these numbers, which are Ghana Health Service numbers, which they held a conference on last year, I would be conversant and happy with what Dr. Dumaku, who is my friend, and Prince Yassari, who is my father, virgin, have said. No, I am not. And it's not because so it's either there is a policy breakdown, the policy exists, but the implementation has not turned around into health outputs so that you get the health outcomes, which is a decline in the number of people. If you listen to Dr. Adubako, the numbers he's putting out are scary. And if we are getting these uptakes, and our, our patient per capita is virtually stagnating, and the policy has been implemented for six and a half years, then obviously the statistics do not support what Dr. Nsiasari has said. And he has those documents because they put them out. So if I am wrong, he can speak to the documents. Um, President Dr. Sassari, want to address that quickly because there are questions for you from some of the patients. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring the statistics here. But maybe Dr. Adumako can assist us because he is a regional director. But I believe if you look at even the number of diabetes and hypertension that Dr. Adumako has given, I don't know where he's coming from, but in 2019, he said the, the hypertension was 19,000. 23,000 in 2020, 31,900 in 2021, 32,000 in 2022. And the same thing is also for diabetes. Which means, we should, ask, we should ask ourselves a question. Were these diagnoses done as part of the wellness clinic or not? He is talking the global issue of per capita OPD attendance. And you should also know that uh, between 2019 and the 2020, 2021, because of COVID, OPD attendance apparently came down. So it also has an effect. But the question I ask Dr. Siedu, my nephew, is that he should also tell us, I mean, he should also avert himself to the point that these increases in diabetes and hypertension that you are seeing, they are all maybe patients who, some of the patients who went for normal checks, 
But as, we, as I said, it's not every hospital or every clinic or every health center which has set up the wellness clinic. That's what we are encouraging Ghana Health Service to set up. And it's not all Ghanaians who are availing themselves now to uh, the wellness clinic attendance or the, what I call adult way. We've been speaking about it. We've been telling people, and I think it should be a campaign by all of us that let us look at ourselves, and especially employers. I believe that when you want to promote anybody, you should first ask, have you gone for medical check? And it should be something that should be done in every workplace. You can call even the hospitals that you work with that come to our, our maybe joy and then come and do a checkup for all our employees here. It should be done. And these are the ways that we can do to at least early diagnose all these diseases. But more importantly, is prevention and, ch- and lifestyle ch- uh, changes that we are having. Mm. We have to try as much as possible to prevent these things. And there are ways we can prevent them. We all know. Don't eat too much sugar, do a lot of exercise, walk around, and don't live a, sanit- a sed- sedentary life and all sorts of things. So it's an individual. You see, health is the responsibility of the policymakers and then whoever is in charge. And as well as the responsibility of you, the individual. Mm. And it's all needs, we need to be talking and let people do the uptake of health services in our society. I think um, this is an important conversation, as I said, and uh, we are very sympathetic to the plight of the dialysis patients. Now, just to also give you some numbers, uh, we've been under recovering for some time now. As I said, our prices were set about three years ago. So, this, uh, if I, and you should also appreciate where we've come from. When dialysis started in Kolibu, the average cost per session was around about $100 per session, equivalent of $100. And now the price has come down considerably. As of today, we're doing, we're, but the current, we are now recovering for the current uh, price. And so we also need to, much as we sympathize with the patients, we also need to keep the service sustainable. And so First Sky support has been very, very tremendous in helping us to be able to provide service for about 80%, free that is for 80% of the patients that we treat. Unfortunately, because of the increase in the cost of the consumables, not the increase in the cost as such, because in, the, in, uh, in Forex it's the same, but uh, when it comes to the CD equivalent, it's gone up. So we need to uh, you know, make the, those adjustments. And so that is a uh, solution. In fact, as we stand now, the renal unit has a deficit or has a financial deficit of 4 million cities that we need to, uh, you know, that we are trying to find ways of... Is, that, is that debt? Yes, that's Or you debt. owe a supplier? No, it's debt. Yes, debt. Debt that we owe... To How do you accrue that? Okay. How was that accrued? It's because of, of the under-recovery from the, from the service that we are providing. And so to continue to run at full throttle uh, would mean that with this debt is going to balloon. Okay, and that is why there was a need for us to look at adjusting the, uh, the, the, you know, the price whilst we also engage with the next relevant stakeholders to see how best this deficit can be met. In fact, somebody mentioned the fact about the, the nurse talk about the uh, machines. That's, uh, I think you have 90 says. Yes, in fact, we had about 13. Uh, but now, how many do you have? You know, we, had, we had about 15, but now I think they are about uh, 12 or so functional. But then um, we also have about 45 uh, you know, machines that the supply or, or the, the supply is supposed to bring in, you know, to show up our services. That be, what that have been withheld because of this debt, you know. Who, who is withholding it? That's the Fizinos Medical Care. Uh, that's the company that uh, produces the dialysis machines and supplies the consumables. To so, call the boutique, you know. Yes, you have a contract with them? Yes, please. Okay. Well, what's, what, what is the arrangement with them exactly? So they supply, and then they, yes. how do they make their money? You pay them? Yes, so we pay, yes, so we pay, yes, so they, they, the supply is going, then we pay them. But then we have to pay them in euros. And so, so you can imagine what happens, that you accumulate, uh, you know, you, 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 you're taking money in cities, and you accumulate, uh, uh, you know, the money to, to transfer. But then as you accumulate, as, you know, like last year, for, for example, when there was that sharp, uh, you know, change in the, uh, Exchange rate. That means that by the time you are ready to transfer, you know the CD has actually lost a lot of value. So those are some of the challenges that we've had, and we are in negotiations trying to see with them if we can actually, uh, you know, uh, do a certain benchmark on the price for, you know, let's say 
every year or every half year so that we do not we are not subject to those uh, we reduce our exposure to that kind of uh, fluctuation so, so what what is this now they've withheld the uh, the export of yeah. those materials into Ghana no we've, we've, they, we've been able to secure uh, some of the consumer in fact the decision to reduce our outwards that we're running low on consumables and because of the debt the outstanding debt the supply had been withheld and so we managed to find some money to to pay them uh, to pay some which enabled them to release more consumables uh, to us in fact it was during that period that uh, the outpatient services was restricted and the question so that I was asked directly with, was when will you open it exactly so we are now engaged with government with the ministry with other stakeholders to see how quickly we can you know, find the resources to advance. Because at the moment, we are sitting in a 4 million uh, city hall. And so, uh, and every session of dialysis that we do, because if you look at um, the current, uh, if we are to operate at uh, our uh, current capacity, which is about 2,000 uh, dialysis sessions every month, then it means that we are going to accumulate about 961,000 cities of debt every month. Uh, you know, in addition to the 4 million cities that we have already. So this is financially unsustainable. And that is why we are also in discussion to see how this can be ameliorated. Okay, so, so that's back to the question. When will you open? We are hoping, we are hoping to get a breakthrough in terms of getting some uh, advancement in terms of funds so that once that is secured, then we can be able to open the service out fully. But so, as I said, we are still open for emergency. So if any patient... Uh, you know, the, the situation becomes critical and it's an emergency. We are still open to treat those. We are still treating emergencies. So for clarity, as we speak tonight, you can't tell when exactly the OPD will be open. Yes, exactly. You can't tell. I can't, yes. Okay, I'm and then fundamentally, to... because you don't have consumables, enough consumables. No, we have the consumables. Don't get me wrong. Okay. We've secured the consumables. But if we deploy the consumables now at the current rate, we are under recovering. So and can raise the funds to pay Exactly. Okay. So, you know, so then we'll, we'll still, it will become a visual cycle. Then in the end, we may not even be able to do the emergencies and uh, the inpatients. So at the moment, we are providing the service at the old price for inpatients and for anyone who comes in as an emergency. Mm -hmm. So that uh, 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 you know, safety basket is there. You know, but then for us to be able to roll out, the, the, like, to go back to our maximum uh, you know, output, we'll need to be able to find a way of recovering and uh, otherwise means we are going to end up in a deeper financial hole. Um, uh, we'll come back to the tax question because it's very, very important has, has come up. But uh, I'm sorry, before we even answer that question, uh, he's may, saying... May I, may I add? May I add uh, okay. You know, because uh, I think uh, one of the issues that came up... Uh, I'll, I'll give you time, okay. I promise you, okay. All right. <laughs> when we come back so we can address that in full because you've made a very important point. You said you're working with government to help you in this particular the, the yeah, issue yeah, you have now. I, I was, I was, actually, there's something to do with the, you know, the, I, I'm interested in solutions. Yeah, you know, we'll come to that. Yeah, Trust yeah. me, I mean, we'll, we'll come to that. But I, because you have the here, he says, okay. directly, he says they need your help to get this particular challenge with the, with the financing sorted. When, when is government going to give that help? And in what form will they get it? Yes, first and foremost, what I would say is that there's a tax exemption regime. So you're going to taxes. See, the, one of the issues of, we have to get a big a solution to the whole issue. If you can address this specifically for me, I'll be very grateful. The yes, question about, government, they need help now, yes, I saw him, so you can open the OPD. I saw him yesterday of his board chair at the presidency. So the help is being sorted out, and they will get the help as quickly as possible. Okay, so what help exactly do you need? Do you need the government to give you tax relief, or you need them to give you money? Then, that's very, let's drill down. What, what do you need? That's, for, that's what I wanted to answer the tax. There's a tax exemption. For, forgive me, I think he has an answer. What exactly do you need? Because the conversation we are having is solutions, right? And this is a very important part for those who need that, that uh, treatment. So, so what exactly so, do so, you need yeah, So immediately, now? immediately an, an, uh, an injection of capital to help us clear the outstanding debt would immediately, you know, free us up. And so government should us. give you money? Yes, exactly. And Four then, million or more? Yes, please. And then, and, then, and then we also need to look at the long-term solution in terms of the, the current pricing, because if we do not also look at the pricing, that means we'll find ourselves back in this situation a few, uh, you know... Uh, you know uh, when you say pricing, you want government to bear part of the cost? That is a solution that we all have to look at. Whether we are going to uh, increase our contributions to health insurance... 
that's an option because if you look at the health insurance contributions, for instance, we are paying very little. I mean, somebody who earns maybe 10,000 cities a month, how much health insurance premium do they pay in a year? Just about maybe 100 and something cities. It's very, something very paltry. But then if all the advanced economies that we've gone to, you find out that when you get your, uh, your paycheck, maybe about 5% of your salary goes into national health uh, contributions. And now that we have, we, have, uh, we have, everybody has a Ghana card, we can identify uh, most individuals within the country. We can track you know, payments of uh, this insurance premium. So then we are, uh, and then I think that um, we can also make sure that these monies go directly into the health insurance kitty so that it doesn't have to go through a circuitous route so that it's all available for the health insurance to be able to deploy in terms of the health of people. So today is dialysis, tomorrow it's something else. So, so that we can look at the basket of conditions that affect Ghanaians because all these people are Ghanaians and as I've always been saying is that the quality of every society is determined by how you know, what, uh, uh, you know, how we treat the, the most vulnerable. The vulnerable, exactly. the most vulnerable yes. you know, so that is what we are looking at. So I think that if we're able to do something like that, you know, immediately to free up a lot of resources so that health insurance can become meaningful. Because, you see, you do not, personally, I, my friends, you don't need insurance for something like malaria because malaria treatment has come down so, I mean, so much that the average person or even the, the poor person can afford, you know, to treat malaria. But then if you have a road traffic accident, if you have... Uh, uh, you know, uh, pregnancy complications. Or a kidney. You have dialysis, a, kid yes, a kidney failure. You would, you would need support. No matter how, uh, you know, if, if you're a middle class person, it is a big drain. So I, I hear you so say the, the NHIS must cover this. I'm not saying it's covered, but I'm saying that we must, uh, uh, NHIS could potentially cover this, but we must also look at the contributions that we are making into the NHIS. Because then because if, you, if you increase the contribution, you get more money exactly. to then subsidize. So then the because at the moment, we are looking at about 700, oh, cover completely. Or between 700 and 1,000 people. All right? And we did the math and realized that, look, you need, uh, let's say if that number is about 1,000, you mm -hmm. need about 3.4 million cities every month to cover all those people in terms of their, need, their dialysis needs. So that works about, about, about 36 mm -hmm. million cities a year. For that is, you know, so that is a potential solution that we can be able to find if we are able to increase the contributions that we are making to NHIS. The other issue that we have to look at is also the, uh, you know, organ transportation because dialysis is actually organ transportation. Yes, sorry, sorry organ transportation. Yes. Transplantation. Yes. So that and, and in this uh, particular situation, it is kidney transplant because you know, no matter how good the dialysis machine is, it can never be substitute for you know a kidney, and so that is something that. It's the only way that people can exit from being on, hooked on dialysis for the rest of their lives. And so that is, in fact, that's why uh, what we did as a teaching hospital was to build capacity so that now our local surgeons are able to carry out transplants on their own. In fact, next month, we are going to have the next uh, uh, session of, of transplantation. And that's why we also uh, started canvassing the issue of, in fact, your, 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 your colleagues were there to support us, you know, to start canvassing the issue of having a national policy on organ transplantation in general, so that it covers both kidney and liver, uh, eye, skin, you know, all those. And you that. make an important point. It goes to the question, the first question, yeah. and I, I want to put that to um, Dr. Nsian Sari. Doc, but before that, though, you said they will get the money because they've met the president. Yes, there's a discussion going on. So they will get the money, you can assure, because everybody's listening. This is very, very important. Yes, they have to be supported for Ghanaians to get the treatment. So you, you can assure us today on the show that Kolebu will get the money to open the OPD? Kolebu is chief executive for us at the presidency yesterday of the board chairman. So I, I, I'm, 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 I just want to get a commitment. They will get the money. Oh, the government is to assist and help the people. So whatever government wants to do to assist the people, that's what government they will do. Then, but, mm -hmm. Let's go to the question that was asked of you. The question which was asked was, what are we doing about organ donation? Yes. We can do it very briefly so I could... Yes, as I said, brief. there's a document which is being reviewed so that we have a law. It's very, very important. It has to go through cabinet for cabinet approval and then move to parliament for parliamentary uh, approval and a, a, a president will assent to it. So that we can harvest the organ, we can uh, store the organ and also donate the organ. It's not only for kidney because even for the in vitro fertilization that they are doing, it's a tissue. Skin from other person to another person, it's a tissue. So all these things should be backed by law. And that is what is going on. And as I said, I'm very key. He is very key. Everybody is key. The Ghana Kidney Association, the Ghana mm. Ophthalmological Association, and then even the Plastic Surgery Association and the IVF team 
are all on us, and some of us have taken up as our, because I'm a doctor, mm. first and foremost, that this thing should be done and done as quickly as possible. And then, as he rightly, as the doctor once said also, we are building the capacity of our surgeons. Actually, kidney transplant is one of the most not so complicated things that we can do as any surgeon can do. And we know that uh, there's also a urology unit which is almost completed at Kolebu. It will be part of the place where we can have also renal transplant done and to train our uh, doctors and our nurses and all the health workers to go into that type of field. I know Konfonochi also is trying to do the same thing. So if you have about three or four transplant centers across the country and you have where the organ is, and the people should also know how to donate parts of their bodies. As uh, one of the patients said, everybody has two kidneys. And normally we need about one kidney to carry out all that. So you can easily donate. And the most important is, to me is the eye. When anybody die, is about to die and your eye is good, you can remove your eye and then donate your cornea to somebody. Because after all, when you die, you, have, you close your eyes. So when the, the eye is not there, nobody will even notice it. And these are things that, as a country, moving forward in our health systems, we can do in this country. And even Ghana then will become a medical tourist center where mm. the 380 million people in the West Africa sub-region. Many will say you're looking too far ahead. People, the, no, we are problems not. We, we have to solve the basic we, ones we first. We solve the problem, and we solve the problem in such a way that it also, we can also solve even every other problem. Mm. And uh, one of the most important things is that even before we go to all these things, I am also challenging Kolebu, Konfanochi, anybody who has a renal dialysis, to, to have a bulk procurement. So if they all join together, when you buy it in bulk, you get the prices down. I remember I used to do it with my uh, senior brother from Palm Boatin, where we were calling. We were buying some drugs bulk, and it was very cheap and as, uh, affordable to the people. So that's what we mm. also are telling them to do. And the, the most important thing is that our pharmaceutical companies in Ghana and the new ones which are coming up should go into manufacturing of the consumables, especially... There was a story the today yes. that talked about that. I remember very well that uh, at the World Health, Health, uh, World Health Summit, I think 2019, 2000, I think 2019, Brown, B. Brown in, 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 um, <clears throat> in, in Germany said they want to build a center like that in West Africa, and they thought Ghana is a place to go. Mm. But then COVID came, and uh, everybody went... Talk still. And thankfully, as I said, we have the uh, National Health Insurance Authority's rep with us. He's Oswald Isia Mensa, Director of Corporate Affairs there. Uh, Oswald, so when is the National Health Insurance Scheme going to take up the cost of dialysis? Uh, thank please. you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me acknowledge my seniors in the studio with you, Senior Odadia and Senior Pescova with you there. Um, these conversations is very important, Ivan Samasi. I've been listening and I've been online for the past of almost two hours, hmm. listening to the plight of um, the patients and um, all the contributions that have come from my, my co-panelists. It's, it's very critical. And for me, I would say that the conversation must not stop. It must not stop. And I recognize that a lot of things that have been said on this on this forum, you know, have snippets of... Um, solutions. But in summary, what I'll say is we must have a coordinated and holistic and a sustainable approach to these challenges that is confronting us today. I hear we're talking about a stopgap measure of putting, injecting some capital into Kolebu to get it up, up and running. But the question is, how sustainable would that be even going forward? Dr. Casolo is right in saying that let's support the NHIS to do this. NHIA, as we all know, has its own set of constraints. Is a scheme that was funded 20 years ago. This year, we're celebrating 20 years of the scheme. But what is critical is that the funding to the scheme has remained almost the same in terms of our premium collection. One of the co-panelists also mentioned, as we speak today, the informal sector, this, these are people who are not on slate, pay at most 30 CDs for a whole year on being on the National Health Insurance Scheme. And if you're a slate contributor, you're paying something around six or seven CDs as processing fee for a whole year. About 70% of the members on the scheme do not pay any form of premium. How can this scheme 
stand on his feet and shoulder all these disease conditions that is being thrown at NHIS on a continuous basis. As we speak, there's call for inclusion of prostate cancer, there's call for mental health, there's call for dialysis. All the calls keep coming, but the conversation stops at how NHIA will fund all of this. Mm. So the conversation must continue. The biggest source of revenue for NHIA is the levies, which contributes about this NHIA L levies contributes about almost 93%. The levies come in, and as again, co panelists have, have rightly said, doesn't come straight to the NHIA. It goes into a central fund for reasons. Of course, um, the fund itself is also capped. So even money that is allocated to the scheme is not received at the end of the year in totality. Um, that gap, of course, we know goes to fund other emergencies and so on and so forth. But we must have that conversation to an extent where what is due NHI perhaps mm. should come to NHIS. So NHI will be liquid enough and should be able to take on everything that is being thrown at it. Uh, Mr. Francisco, this is one of the issues that you've talked about as part of the series, and you focus on the capping. Right, I'm just laughing. I'm sitting here and I'm laughing. It's, it's ludicrous because, look, in 2017, when this government came in, on the wings of a lot of us thinking that the previous government had been symbolic, and I make no apologies for my views then, the first thing they did was to pass a law to say statutory payments could be capped and they could then decide what they were going to use it for. What they didn't realize, and that is why I always go by data, they didn't look at our 10-year disease trends to realize that our disease burden as a country was doubling. And we were moving from a situation where predominantly infectious diseases were the mainstay of our disease burden to a state where chronic diseases are the mainstay of our disease burden. So, for example, currently, if you look at 2022 data, malaria is still the leading cause of mortality, but it's contributing to our mortality has dropped by 46.6%, whereas strokes have gone up by almost 10%. So, if you go capping the funds, when the diseases that are causing people to die are more expensive to manage. You cannot convince me that the NHIS, and that's why you've seen on my social media handles, I've asked the question. Those people telling me and Ghanaians that the NHIS should take on and fund dialysis, where are they going to get the money from? The truth of the matter, and that was why some of us raised hell when this whole capping law was going in. The truth of the matter of a health insurance scheme is that you expect them to have an excess of influence so they can invest it. So when they are recalled to pay for some of these more expensive procedures like chronic diseases, dialysis, um, prostate cancer, um, breast cancer, they can get money out of the investments they have made with the premiums they have received to pay for them. But this government, in its wisdom, telling us we have the men, took the money and said they can prioritize where the money should go. So I'm now listening to someone from the NHIS telling me that we are not liquid. And I'm saying, now, who mm. How can you be liquid when you never invested the monies that were coming to you for six and a half years? You can't be. And that's why, though we are having a serious conversation, I am laughing. Because I'm like, we shot ourselves in the foot, and now we are bleeding, and we are saying, how come the gun hurt? The gun was going to hurt. It was a bullet, for God's sake. It wasn't a sponge. It was a bullet. We shot ourselves. We expected to bleed. And this is why I'm saying this conversation should have ha happened yesterday. But it's happening now. So let's think of making sure that a lot of things like this whole capping and other things are repealed as a master of agency. Mm. Because yep. I cannot sit here and say it's just straightforward. 
the NHIS should take over funding of dialysis. They cannot afford it. Okay, stay with me. And they mean, cannot afford it because of our laws. Th thankfully, thankfully, the man who advises the president is here with me. When are you removing the carpet? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think uh, Dr. Asiedu also knows that it's not every disease which every insurance covers. Insurance, I haven't seen any insurance which covers everything. Yes, there's the levy, and that's what the Oswald was talking about. We will continuously be dialoguing to see where, for example, we will get more resources for, first and foremost, the most important thing to me, it's not even anything, but first, the a wellness clinic. That's one for health prevention. And two, now we, we've been adding a lot of other things onto the NHIA benefit package. Seriously, I believe that after adding sickle cell and then also accepting for uh, cancer patients and prostate cancer, one of the things that you have to add is, for example, children of renal failure. And secondly, uh, thirdly, I also know that acute renal dialysis, acute renal failure of dialysis is covered. It's a chronic which is not covered. Most countries have the way, other ways of paying for, either from insurance or from some top-ups or from something else. Yes, there's capping. If you are in a country where um, taxes are not what you are supposed to get, about 16 of it, now that you are moving it up, that's what governments will make sure that things work. But the dialogue continues. I've been on National Health Insurance Board before. We've been talking about how much can we have insurance take and become viable and sustainable. And as you rightly say, yes, insurance is you collect the money, you invest, and all sorts of things. When health insurance started 20 years ago, I remember very well in 2009, there was about 300, over $300 million as um, in investment for health insurance because there were only few people on health insurance. Now the number of people on health insurance is increasing. And I quite agree with him that, yes, everything that you buy, including the water which is by me here, you pay a levy. Mm. If all the levy is not capped and is sent to health insurance directly, I'm sure we'll not be sitting here doing this conversation. So remove the capping. When will that happen? So we have to, as Osmar said, we have to do the actual studies to find out that if you are adding this, you are adding this, this is what you get. And then we move forward in that direction. Why we do that? We may not even need increase in premium. But well, you haven't addressed the capping. Because question. in Ghana, I'm coming. Coming to the capping issue. In Ghana, we have a very unique health insurance where it's funded through levy. So capping, there's the dialogue which is going on between National Health Insurance, Minister of Health, and the Minister of Finance. If you are going to Minister of Finance, from my experience, we have to go there with facts and figures, and this, which National Health Insurance is doing now. So now that we realize that National Health Insurance is having problems and then maybe they are having liquidity problems, there's a capping. How much can you maybe take from health insurance to do other things? It's not only the benefits which the health insurance pays direct, uh, directly. There are other things. For example, health promotion, health education, Vaccines for children, for vaccination, are all paid from the health insurance bills. And then initially also some, some for infrastructure development. So it's something which is being talked about, but that I'm sitting down laughing and all this, I don't think it's a thing that I have Okay, so, so you're saying the government is considering the yes, removal of the Yes, there's a dialogue ongoing, okay. as Oswald said, and the National Health Insurance Board will bring that document it goes to the Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, Minister of Finance, sit down around the round table and discuss it okay. and come out with a solution. Dr. Sir, many of you, some corporate entities as well, calling, they want to help. If you're attached and willing to help the patients on dialysis, the facilities doing it as well, the multimedia group will provide an avenue for you to do so. And so reach out as we do this together.
I'm What's very your angry. What's your story? I am very angry. I'm more angry at this morning. People are dying each day. The dialysis machine in Kolebu got spoiled. Do you know the number of people who died? A 24 year old boy died this morning. His father is a teacher. His father is a teacher. Gave over 30 years of his life to the service. Could not afford transplants. Could not afford dialysis. 400 cities a week. What do you mean? Do you know how much taxes they check out every day? The cost of living. But you bring in flowers for your daughter's birthday. You bring a cake to celebrate 11. God will judge the government.